Mashitas, Centre Mabini, Centre Duenas, Centre Palacios, Centre Guthard, Centre Respicio, Senator Ada. And joining us, thank you very much, Senator. Senator Rodriguez. I know there are others I saw somewhere roaming around. Senator Tyhoon, welcome. Senator Blas, buenas. Senator Tony Ada. The legislature is uh, back in session on the uh, second reading. Everyone, I hope everyone has a, a copy of the amended uh, agenda. And uh, let me see, they were they just recently gave it to you this afternoon. And the first bill that we have that with a committee report and ready to go would be Substitute Bill Number 62, and I recognize uh, the author, Senator Palacios, on 62. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move that Bill 62-31 is substituted by the Committee on Utilities, Transportation, and Public Works, and Veterans Affairs be accepted. Uh, it's already accepted, oh, so oh, now yeah. just to... Uh, so I, I move the business to be moved to the to reading file for for purpose of discussion. You may proceed. And if I may make presentation. Yes, please. Uh, Madam Speaker, the re real purpose of Bill 62 is actually to address the hazards and uh, safety issues with respect to road construction out in the streets and especially on our main roads. And so it has become a common sight, uh, you know, with road uh, roadways being ducked up and then. Uh, it took a month to restore, and even after it's been restored, uh, maybe the restoration is not uh, to the original condition uh, before the, uh, the digging up. Uh, and a few months after restoration, sometimes this again uh, deteriorate, sometimes in six months. And all these things are actually being addressed. Uh, currently, there's no deposit required to dig up parts of the roadway. For example, to connect a sewer line or uh, to run uh, a water line. And one just go get a permit. Uh, this is the private contractors building houses and apartments and, and other things. Uh, I guess a, a vivid example is the one in Manila. Uh, and th that's not the only place, but that's been there for, as far as I can remember, Madam Speaker. I think 10 months now. And so there's no incentive actually to expedite the restoration of this uh, uh, temporary, uh, I guess, uh, dug up and on the roadways. And there's no penalty for poor restoration after all this is been restored. And of course, there's no deposit made for all this. So there's no way public works can go back to the contractor and penalize that. Or on, and while it can go ahead and force the contractor to go and address the issue and make further repair, uh, a lot of times, more often than none, Madam Speaker, that just not followed through. So this bill proposes to require a reasonable deposit of $500 or 
or 5% of the value of the project, uh, which is greater, of course, and if before permitting takes place. And this is strictly just for security deposit. I think the permit itself has a fee, but there's no deposit for, for, for the, to ensure the proper restoration of the roadway. Uh, the, the, and this bill proposes to hold that deposit to one year. Why? Because it has been the experience in the past that sometimes, sometimes the quality of work is, is, is not really visible, that it's a poor quality until maybe past three months, four months, definitely within the year. So public works input is that based on, based on their experience, one year would be sufficient, and if the uh, repair work uh, again fall into a lower standard, after one year, I think uh, that to them that's acceptable at this time. But definitely, there's no timeline right now. And the the bill provides, of course, for the emergency digging by public works, uh, even though, of course, uh, they would be required that as soon as practical, they would have to go and get a permit later on. And so there is, of course an exception or a provision here to address emergency digging so that, you know, uh, property, a damage to property can be minimized or prevented or even loss of life. And so this is what uh, bill does not apply. This bill that does not apply to government funded projects and other projects requiring, requiring, of course, insurance bonding because insurance bonding has its own built in uh, surety for, for just to make sure, of course, that the project is completed in time and the damage has been restored. So this is just for the simple permitting to dig up and connect, I guess, a sewer line and then pull it back and patch it up and then it's gone. This view actually addresses that. But with additional input and review by Public Works, and by the way, uh, there, was about, there were about three meetings back and forth with Public Works, uh, myself and my staff going up and discussing this. They, 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 did a very good input here. And even the, uh, uh, the Contractors Association and those uh, who were involved uh, supported this. They don't mind the, uh, I guess, the 12 month holding of deposits before release. Uh, Madam Speaker, more road works, as we know, will continue, of course, to take place as Guam grows. And even more so, uh, Bill, Bill 62 would become necessary. And I ask, of course, for the support of my colleagues uh, and with that, I, I ended my presentation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. Um, on the motion, recognize Senator Frank Bloss. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I, while I stand and rise in support of, of the, uh, the measure by the good gentleman from Salampago, there are some concerns with regards to, um, I guess, some of the mechanisms uh, involved in, in, in basically ensuring that this, this, this occurs. And while one of my concerns was with, with regards to the amount of time uh, it was necessary for the, the fee itself to be um, held in abeyance by the Department of Public Works to ensure that the, um, the, re the repair of the roadway that had to have been excavated to be able to do that work um, was, was done properly. Concern that I have, and maybe what I'll do, ma'am, is I'll go ahead and I'll voice my concerns with regards to this and hoping that the good author can yield to some of the, to the questions that I may have. And one of the concerns that I have here is with regards to uh, once the repair work is done per se, the, the bill does not address us to what, by what standards this repair work is going to be done or, by, or who is going to conduct the inspection uh, that uh, you know the proper inspection necessary to ensure that this this was, was done properly and in accordance with with um, with the standards for 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 that roadway. Secondly, with regards to the emergency excavation, um, the bill recognizes that there's going to be a point in time when there's going to need to be an excavation because of an emergency, um, and that uh, you know there's somewhat of a waiver of of the application process. Um, it does not address us to who the contractor has to go to to be able to basically ascertain or to provide um, the justification for the emergency excavation. 
I can just foresee that in, in, in some cases, you, there, there, there is a plethora of instances or, or, or um, you know, reasons as to why a contractor would say this is an emergency excavation, so therefore they didn't have to go through this process. I think that it's incumbent upon us before we move on this thing is, is maybe, uh, again, uh, bring these concerns to the floor and, and hopefully the, the author would yield to these questions so that we can tighten up the legislation here. Would Thank you, you like uh, the author to yield to the question? And, and, and if right he now? can, and uh, with regards to the, the concerns Blossers, that I have. Do you yield to the question? There are two questions, so maybe uh, Senator Blasi. And if you want me, I can repeat. The first, one. the first one was when the work is complete, completed, who will be doing the inspections? That correct? Who, who will conduct the, the, the inspection and by what standards going to be utilized to be able to ensure that this the restoration of this of the road work of this roadway that was excavated um, conforms to, to, to standards. Senator Plasius. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on page four, beginning of actually on line, line somewhere in line three, that paragraph, it actually says here that the department of Pub, uh, that the department which is public works conducts a site inspection of the road or highway project area in which the opening or excavation had occurred and can ascertain that the repairs were conducted are completed properly in accordance with, with uh, ap applicable uh, statutes. Uh, currently, Madam Speaker, they are doing that now. The reason why this is in this bill is that this bill is to require the permitting and the deposit for projects that do not require bonding or insurance. Like I said, maybe a simple project just to get a permit to connect the sewer line, which is only about maybe 50 feet from, from a residence. Those kind of projects actually do not require deposit. And so with this bill, it, it, it will address that. But for a larger project, it is already, I guess, in place that even before the project is uh, awarded out, it's already all built in into that. We, they're doing that now. So uh, public works is the one. Now, by what standard? Uh, I would think that they already have a standard now uh, for, the, for the projects that are bonded or insured. And so I would think that they have the standard. I mean, that, that, that's my assumption, uh, Madam Speaker. Senator Bloss, uh, did, was he able to answer your question? Um, in part, Madam Speaker, because Madam Speaker, my concern is, and, and recognizing the fee is $500 or 5% 5 of the, of the project, whichever is greater. Um, there may be instances, Madam Speaker, where the, if it's, it's just a $500 fee, but the cost for the repair, for the proper repair, may be in excess of that. Then what happens there? I mean, obviously, it's going to be insufficient. There's no grounds in as far as being able to recoup the actual cost necessary to be able to repair that roadway. The tractor will just walk away and not have, you know, just pay the $500, although it may cost the government $1,200 to fix. So what then? I mean, that's the concern, that, that's the other con at to what standard, and if the standard isn't met, and the standard if, if there's an ex exceeds the amounts necessary for the fee, then what happens? Senator, uh, you, uh, you Madam Speaker, that's a good point. Uh, of course, it says here that $500 or 5% of the project, but if the project uh, is only cost 10000 and of course, uh, and, and if the repair is going to cost more than that, then there's a, a problem there. Uh, but that is the, I guess, the, from the experience of public works, that's, that, that is the figure that they arrive at. Understand that this has actually been worked on by public work after the public hearing, going back and forth, and the engineering were involved, uh, drawing upon their past experience and so forth. So that's my best explanation at this point, uh, Madam Speaker. Senator Blas, uh, you do have a second question. And I do have a second question. I think that, but going back to the first question, and I recognize in as far as the concern and, and how they was derived, and, and, and maybe it would be necessary in the future, should this uh, pass into, into law, that, that uh, we'll, I guess we'll base it on experience with regards to whether or not this, this, this is a proper assessment of the fee. Because I just don't want to get into a situation where you know, the excavation, again, you know, the cost for the, for, for the repair work is, is more than the deposit fee and the contractor just walks away and we really have no recourse. My concern is right now, because of this, I don't know we have any legal recourse to go after the contractor if, it's, if it costs any more than that. 
Um, that's something that, it, it, again, I don't want it to go against the bill. I like the bill. I, I, I just want to see if we can tighten that up. The second area is with regards to the emergency excavation is it, although it, it basically provides for, a, again, um, uh, a process prior to the issuance of the permit or, or deposit, my concern is who provides that certification that it is an emergency excavation? Senator, do you yield to the question? Madam Speaker, for that part, Madam Speaker, again, there's already established a process uh, by which, of course, uh, people apply. And that provision of this bill is essentially uh, allowing for an emergency to, to proceed, let the work proceed, but the individual performing or the company performing emergency project it still has to go and get a permit to begin with. So the emergency provision is just allow the work to perform without first getting a permit. And, and it requires a justification. Of course, an explanation, uh, if you read the, uh, it's right here the, that the, uh, the, except for prior permit, none of the, well, let me see, it, an emergency evacuation may be made without prior permit or deposit if the reason for the excavation is to prevent loss of life or damage to property, that appears to be imminent if the excavation is delayed. So probably that will be the basis is, can this not wait? And if it cannot wait because uh, it, it might short circuit and involve an explosion of things like, I, you know, those things, or there is a, an, an underground, and uh, I guess, hollow of the ground and then Anything that can be related to that, I, I would say that that is an emergency. But then it remains, of course, to be seen at, at that point. But it, it, it has to relate to prevention of loss of life or damage to property. And it, 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 it can come later and probably attach to the application of the permit, which would, I think, according to the discussion with us, it should happen within, within 48 hours. You know, you do the emergency, but simultaneously in the, the following morning, Daybreak, somebody has to be already processing the application. That's, Senator, that's are you? No. Uh, you still have the floor. <laughs> it, 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 it's still basically, I, I'm concerned, a little concerned as to who provides that emergency, um, that, that certification for the emergency excavation. Something I probably can talk to the author with uh, offline with regards to this. That said, Madam Speaker, I, I, I guess then, along those lines with the emergency uh, excavation. Um, on page five, starting um, in line 13, basically where, it's, where after it has been deemed that the excavation was not emergency, the applicant shall be penalized $500 for failure to properly secure a permit prior to excavating. Um, I, I think we wanna make sure, and if, if this is the intent of the author, we wanna make sure that this $500 penalty is inclusive and that the, is on top of the required $500 necessary for the permit. So if you read this language, it basically states that if, there, if the permit was done, or, or the excavation was done without the permit, there's a $500 penalty, but is that just the penalty and not the processing of permit fee, or, or, or do we have intent of it's $500 penalty, plus then you have to, you have to pay for the, uh, the permit? And maybe that's my third question, if the author could yield to that. Yes. Senator, do you yield to the question? No, Madam Speaker, I, I do not know the, the fee for permits right now. It's already established. The $500 deposit is actually a deposit to ensure the, the acceptable restoration of the, the roadways after it's been repaired. Now, this other $500 for, for uh, a fine as a penalty, I would think that they are separate from the deposit. The deposit, if at the onset is deposit, but of course it's an emergency, you don't have time to deposit, but maybe at that point they will be required to deposit, just like regular processing, which is returnable, refundable, uh, upon the completion of the project with the uh, road, road base uh, returned to, uh, I guess, satisfactory condition. Now, if the applicant uh, is not justified, then it depends on, on why the emergency project place in the first place. And the $500 penalty is actually associated with the fact that the work commenced without a permit and according to public works, uh, this could have been done tomorrow or the following day because in their determination it's not emergency. Again, uh, what is emergency is that the prevention of 
life, loss of life or damage to property, I think that would be the overriding consideration. But of course, maybe we can add some language here, maybe warning or given, uh, what given one day to remedy the, the inadequacies of uh, something like that. I, I can agree with that. I mean, I, Madam Speaker, I don't have a problem with it as far as the, 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 the imposition of the penalty. My concern is that with the imposition of the penalty, does that, uh, because this was done in haste, um, does that negate the individual from of the contractor from actually having to pay the proper permit fees, pay the proper deposit fees? This is the penalty. Now, on top of that, my, my assumption here is that this penalty is in addition to yes. what should have been paid properly. Yes. yes. Had this process go through. So, but the way the language reads here is that they can do the emergency excavation, not get the permit, get the $500 uh, penalty, and not be and not have to worry about paying the permit fee or the $500 uh, deposit to ensure that it occurs. Again, this was because you tried to circumvent the system and you tried to do this illegally, I can understand the yeah. penalty. Yeah. But this should not negate or, or preclude the individual from having to pay the proper fees. Yeah. And that's my concern. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I share the observation, of course, of the... Uh, would you like a brief recess? To well, Madam Speaker, in the, in the interest of time and everything, maybe this is something that I can work with a, with a good author on. Um, and, and if you can, if the rules can, can, can allow, we can come back to this. Maybe just, if I may speak, uh, Madam Speaker, maybe just an amendment now that, that to, to, to differentiate that this penalty is in addition to other fees that, That's fine. which is the permitting fees and the deposit fees that are already required. Maybe just that, that it is an addition. It is an addition to other fees established for permitting and for deposits. And that's fine. Because I, I agree with him that uh, you can circumvent this and just say everything would be emergency. Just okay, pay no less me $500 and I'll be fine. I don't have to deposit. Thank that, you very much, uh, Senator, that. for that clarification. On the motion, I recognize uh, Speaker Pengelinen. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I certainly support what is being attempted here. One of the first things I did um, when the new director be, uh, was named to the Department of Public Works was I sent her a letter most especially and on point with this excavation on Gov Guam roads. I started seeing and noticing more contractors getting a permit, digging up the road, leaving it open, and then putting in these steel plates that are two, four inches above the current grade of the road that just wreak havoc on consumers' cars. They wreak havoc on the tires, on the alignment, uh, and it just costs the people money Plus, it presents a safety hazard to the traveling public. So I wrote to her and I said, you got to do something about these things. That these contractors can't just dig up the road and put this thing in place and leave them there until they're good and ready. It just doesn't make sense. So we've got to put in a policy to, to resolve this matter. And so we got a, I got some action. I got a nice letter. Oh, we're going to fix it. And then a couple of the areas that I specifically pointed out had them f filled in. But no more than a week later, 20 feet up the road, they dug the entire road again, and it's still there now. I think rather than putting fines and so forth, I think we should just set timelines that every applicant who comes in and says they're going to dig up a road Estimate to DPW that it's going to take us four days to complete our connection or whatever they're going to do on the road or bury a pipe. And if they don't complete it in four days, they restore that road back to its original condition with the original specs. And if, if they're not finished, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't be in the business of making it easy for them to wreck our lives and endanger our traveling public. We should say, you, with your engineers, say, I'm going to dig up this road. They should first have all of the permits in place. If they need GWA for a water connection, they have a GWA permit. They go up there. They map out the infrastructure. They know where the stub outs are. And then they dig up the road. And then they know that it's going to take them 10 days 
to finish the connections, test it out, and so forth. If they don't complete it in 10 days, cover it back up and come back when you're ready to complete the project. Or if they find out that that's not where the infrastructure is, put it back and go find where the correct site is. But to just let them go. I mean, the, the repair right in front of the entrance to St. Paul's, I wrote her about that. I said, that's been there for like five years. Five years. And they, you know what? We're trying to save the contractor money by letting him put those steel plates on because it, it costs less money to put the steel plates on rather than restoring the road and then coming back five years later and digging it back up. I think that's what they should have done. They should have restored the road and if they're not ready to fix it, come back when they are, dig it back up, put your schedule in place and if you don't mean it, bury it again, put it back to its original specifications and come back when you're ready instead of putting in these plates and having us wait forever. There's one right out here in Marine Drive. There's a depression right in front of Wendy's in Agania for that brand new road, even though they haven't finished the top coat, but the travel, travel coat is finished. But that's a brand new road that's been there and it hasn't been fixed. And I don't know how many letters I wrote to DPW. I'm saying, hey, get your contractor back. This is a brand new road that now there's like an eight inch depression over a five foot area that people swerve to avoid. Why are we letting these contractors get away with it? DPW just say, come back here, fill this back up. If you think you got something else to dig up, when you're good and ready, dig it back up. But right now, the traveling public deserves safe roads where it doesn't wreak havoc on our cars. So maybe I just want to kind of work on an amendment that just says that, that every application shall have a time frame and when they're not done in that time frame, that they dig it, that they restore it, and come back when they're ready to repair the road again, or whatever they're repairing underneath. That's what it's going to take. And that's what this, the traveling public deserves. You know, because they leave these things forever. And it, because it's cheaper for them, and we're letting them get away with it. And I don't think, I think the contractor is going to make sure that the next time he puts in an application, and he says it's going to take him 10 days, he's going to do it in five. Because he doesn't want to risk having to cover it back up and then come back and dig it again. So they're going to do it right the first time because it's going to cost them more money to not do it right the first time and come back. If all they do is put a plate on, it takes $25 to take off that edge that they put on of asphalt, pull up the plate, and they got a hole right there. Meantime, I've got to realign my car twice. I've got to swerve and almost run into somebody four times because I don't want to run over that plate. I admit, when I go down at night, I can close my eyes, swerve, and miss that damn thing, that, that thing by swerving into the middle lane because I know exactly where it's at. And I do that because I don't want to wreck my car. But it's dangerous to do that. We're not supposed to be doing that. But I do it because it wrecks my tires, it wrecks my alignment, and it costs me money. What well, the contractor sitting there saving money at my expense, at your expense. And I say, we just got to tell him to stop. Do it right. Do it right the first time, and we'll be happy to work with you in terms of giving you the permits and expediting all of that. But don't not do the job, put a repair patchwork repair that endangers the public safety and wrecks the public's vehicles and get away with it. So, Madam Speaker, I'd like to just make some kind of amendment here maybe, and while the others are speaking, that will put that in place, that every application shall have a timeline. That er then if they're not able to meet that timeline, they restore the road to the specifications from which when they dug it up, put it back in the condition that ensures public safety and public uh, convenience. And then when you're ready to fix it, come back and fix it because you finally got your act together. Dig it back up. You know, dig it back up. Don't let us pay for the inefficiencies. And if it's because some department or agency 
doesn't know where their water line is or where their power line is or where their cable line is, then don't dig up the road until you know. And when you dig it up and it's not there, that's why, Madam Speaker, one of the things I had put in place in statute that was passed by this body is that when these utilities and companies go out there and place things in our right of ways or in our roads, that in addition to the specifications and the drawings they put in place to receive their permit, that at the end of the job, if they've changed anything in their mapping, that they file what they call as-built drawings. So that if they said, we're going to put this thing in this position, and they go back there, and they dig it up, and they find out they can't put it there because of some reason, and they move it 10 inches up the road, that then when they finish that project, they file a new map at DPW that says, here's the ass built of that. We moved it 10 inches up. So that the next guy that's going to come and dig in that area knows that what they have there is the ass built drawings, that it is not where it was originally applied for, that it's in the ass built drawings that moved it 10 inches. So now they know where to dig. And we have that law in place, and I'm hoping that it's being enforced by GPA, by GWA, by the cable companies, by DPW, requiring these companies to file this as-built drawing so we don't end up having to dig here and then dig there looking for something. We know exactly where we put it on, and when field conditions change where we put it, then we tell everyone else that's going to come behind them to dig in that area exactly what the field conditions are and what changes were made. And so we're trying to fix these kind of things incrementally by some of the policies we're putting in place. And that was one of the pieces of legislation that this body enacted, which I'd sponsored. And I think it's a good thing. And so now on this kind of thing, I just think, you know, these contractors should know what their ob obligations are, should know where these things are. And when you can't complete the job in the application timeline that you asked for, then don't put that plate there and leave it there for 10, 20, 40 days, 180 days, five years, while I have to continually serve, swerve, risk the public safety, realign my car, buy new tires, all within that five years, just so you can save the cost of digging up that area when you're good and ready to repair what's wrong in the original place. And so, Madam Speaker, it's, I don't mind when they put the plates and then they come back the next day and work. But they put the plates and they leave for months at a time. Because I know at least when they put the plates on and they come back and work that they're trying to finish it. But, Ma Madam Speaker, that Chalampago site, they haven't been back. And for whatever reason why those steel plates are there, they shouldn't be there. That road should be restored put back in the original specification until they're now good and ready for whatever f they found out there that said that they couldn't make that repair immediately, put it back. And so if we put this in place now, we know then that these companies will be a bit more careful, will file their applications, DPW will review them and give them what's reasonable. We're gonna be hiring a, 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 an engineer that we've authorized them to hire under federal highways so that we now will have somebody out there that can look at these things, repair, and, and determine that, yes, it's reasonable to expect something like this to be done in 20 days or 60 days. Eight months, totally unreasonable. You can't have a permit to dig it up and leave a hole open with a plate on there for six months. It just is not reasonable. We're not going to approve that permit. We have an engineer that we've authorized DPW to hire, and he can make that determination. So, Madam Speaker, I certainly appreciate what's being proposed here. I just think that as some of the arguments are made, yeah, it's cheaper to, leave, to pay the $500 fine and not come back and restore it, or leave the thing open. But when you're telling them, you got to restore that road to the specifications of what you dug up, then I think they're going to think twice about being more efficient themselves rather than complaining that the government doesn't know what it's doing. So thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and I hope to write something real quick on this uh, for consideration by the body. 
Are there any other speakers? So we're going to go ahead and take a, a brief recess. We're back on while Speaker Ben is preparing his uh, amendment. I understand that the majority minority leader has a uh, proposal that doesn't require us cutting down a tree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this is after discussions with the author um, and the concern with regards to um, imposing the imposition of the penalty uh, in, the, in the cases of the emergency excavation and not making meeting those requirements, my concern was other than the imposition of the penalty, um, it didn't appear that the contractor would be liable for the, 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 the proper fees um, you know, and the deposits necessary to, to, to make that full. So uh, along those lines, and thank you for understanding, I, I don't think it was necessary for us to cut down a tree just for for, for the amendment here, and I'll turn it over to the clerk after we're done, is the amendment will be an, on line 15, page 5 of the bill. And it is basically um, 
after the word excavating, remove the period there and insert the words and still required to pay the appropriate fees and posits. Did, did everybody get that? Get the so the, if, you, if you want me, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and read the, 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 the statement here. In the event the department deems that the excavation was not an emergency, the applicant shall be penalized $500 for failure to properly secure a permit prior to excavating and still required to pay the appropriate fees and deposits. Do everybody understand that amendment proposed? Anybody wish to be heard on the amendment proposed by Senator Bloss? Any objection to the amendment being proffered by the Senator from Barrigada? I see the uh, main author of the bill has no objection. There being no objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe we'll need to take another recess. Amendment uh, being proffered by Senator Pangalinen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the amendment that I'm proposing for consideration by the body uh, would read, um, uh, beginning at um, the first paragraph on section 53105, uh, would read, all applications for excavation of a roadway shall have a schedule of work that sets the timeline and the maximum time before the road is restored to the original condition or better. The contractor shall be required to close the opening and restore the road upon expiration of the time as specified by the permit or DPW chief engineer. One extension for less time than allotted by the original work schedule may be granted by the chief engineer for good reason. So we're not totally being inflexible here. We're recognizing that there may be unexpected circumstances that May, not pre may prevent the contractor from completing the job on time. And so in this case, we're giving, giving some uh, authority to the chief engineer to review that application for an extension uh, and grant an additional extension. Otherwise, I think they should just cover it back up, put it back in its original condition, and when they're ready to come back and finish the work, they just dig it back up. That's just what we deserve uh, in terms of the quality of work that should uh, be done on our roadways uh, and that when we, you know, damage those roadways that we, we put them back as soon as possible. We hold the contractors accountable for their professionalism and their expertise in the work that they do uh, and have them put, put the roadways back in place as soon as possible. And this uh, amendment to the additional language proposed in the bill I think will do that and will assist in implementing the original intent of the bill, which is to put these roadways back to the condition that will allow the convenience and the safety of the traveling public um, and, and accomplish that. So that's my proposal, Mr. Speaker, and I'm asking the body for their consideration. Has everybody received a copy of the proposed amendment? Does any senator wish to be heard on the uh, proposed Pangolinan Amendment? Is there an objection to the Pangolinan Amendment? Is there an objection to the Pangolinan Amendment? Senator Bloss? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm not going to express an objection. It's just I want to make sure that this, there's no ambiguity in, in as far as the, the, the language here. And it's, it's basically in the last sentence, and if you can have the author yield to, to this, it says one extension for the less time, for less time than allotted by the original work. I, I recognize that maybe what it, does this mean that we can ask, for, or was the intent to allow the, in, the the contractor or the company to to basically go in and ask for an extension, but not for for not more than the the original time allotted. Uh, let's say they said. Initially, they were going to do it for two weeks. 
if they're going to go for an extension, they can go for an extension, but not for more than two weeks. Is that what the uh, intent is? Senator Pangolini, do you wish to yield? I think that's not only the intent, but the language. Okay, thank you. Senator uh, Tom Adda. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I understand what the um, mover of the amendment is trying to achieve. The, the concern that I have is that um, this assumes that we know what's underneath that roadway that's going to be dug up. And a good example is the tri-intersection project. Uh, they had timelines of when they thought that we're going to be able to dig things up and and then be able to finish the project. But as they went along, they found that, um, in fact, where they did not expect to find utilities, uh, util they found utilities at a depth that was shallower than what was originally the information that was given to them. Um, they, they came across a, an old fuel tank uh, that was in the ground, which Back then, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency said, okay, fine, if it's not going to be used, just fill it up with cement, plug it up, and, and off you go. Uh, when they came upon that, EPA said, nope, you've got to dig that thing up. And so, of course, that, that extended uh, thing. So um, I, I think the tri-intersection is a good, a good example of we just don't always know what's underneath. So for... A contractor to go out there and dig and say, oh, yeah, I can get this thing done within 48 hours, that assumes that we actually, that, you know, all the information that he got from um, Guam Water Works, that uh, you're not going to find any lines down there, uh, from GPA, from, from whoever. Uh, the as built are not always as accurate. So I, I do have some concerns uh, with this that then... Uh, so, so, you know, I, I think the first part is good from the standpoint that then the contractor uh, uses his best guess estimate and, and uh, tries to gather all the information. But then, uh, and he goes out there and he does the work, and then he comes into all these, these unknowns. Uh, then to be able to be given an extension for less than the allotted time uh, that may, that I think may, may be a problem because then uh, when we actually dig up and we find, we, we actually don't know what's down there, we may find that a project which we originally said was going to take 72 hours may probably take a little bit longer because now uh, in the case of a gas, you know, you find some fuel line or something, now we have to call an EPA, EPA has to do their thing. Uh, and then you get other players involved who are not just necessarily standing around waiting to be uh, activated. And so I do have some concerns with the, um, with the uh, last sentence there, that one extension for less time than allotted by the original work schedule may be granted uh, by the chief engineer for a good reason. And I would like to suggest that maybe that part should be amended to read, one extension may be granted by the chief engineer uh, for good reason. And, and, and if that extension uh, requires you know, we have to get with EPA. How soon can you get your guy out there? And, and if it requires uh, three, four times the original time allotted, then, then that's what it should be. But we probably should leave that to the, chief, the department's chief engineer to, to determine uh, what will be a reasonable time. So I would like to make an amendment to this amendment by simply deleting uh, on that last sentence such that it reads, one extension may be granted by the department's chief engineer for good reason. Thank you, Senator Adda. So <coughs> the Adda amendment is to strike for less time than allotted by the original work schedule. 
Um, who wishes to be heard on that? Senator uh, Penglin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I don't rise uh, to oppose the amendment, but you know, I just think that, I mean, we went from using the tri intersection as an example to a 72 hour permit. And so, if the tri intersection, the original schedule was for, I don't know, 395 days. And so, to say that we should now allow an extension for longer than 395 days doesn't make sense. I mean, you can't have done half the work, found something that will now require you to do, mitigate that, that's longer than it took you to do the entire project. So that's why I said for not longer than the original. So it could be, and, and so, you know, that's the, the issue I, I look at. And so, but I do understand the, the example used that if you go out there and EPA needs to come out and clear it, they may not be available. That, and and I, I appreciate that, and, and that's why I'm not rising in, in opposition to the amendment. But I also think that, you know, we gotta hold our own people to a standard. I mean, you know, if we're now going to allow all these things um, because we can't perform, then, you know, then we got to revamp ourselves. And, and I certainly, again, I'm not opposing the amendment, but I just think that, uh, you know, the examples used just didn't fit. So that, that's all. And I, I support the amendment. I'll, I, I have no objection to it. Any other senator wish to be heard on the other amendment to the Pangolinian Amendment? Senator Silva? No. Oh, okay. Is there an objection to the ADA amendment? Hearing none. On the main Pangolinian amendment, is there an objection as amended by the ADA amendment? Anybody wish to speak on the main amendment as amended? Hearing none. Senator Espicio, do you wish to be heard on the bill? I have your name, the speaker had left it on the list. Anybody else wish to be heard on Bill 62? Senator Palacios, do you wish to close? Uh, thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to make uh, one simple amendment before I close and move this to the reading file, uh, on page four, line 15, page four, line 15, after the word highway, uh, if you can just strike that phrase to its original condition prior uh, to the Speaker, project. Point, point, uh, Mr. Speaker, is he making closing remarks? No, I'm sorry, I, I no. wanted to speak on the bill. Oh, no, no, I'm making that okay. Okay, Senator Adathan, I'm sorry. I Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm in support of the bill, of course, um, but I would like to, uh, on page four, uh, propose uh, an amendment. On line three there, it, it stipulates that the deposit fee uh, that we're talking about here shall be retained by the department for one year from the completion of the road repair. So I complete the re road repair today DPW has to hold that deposit for one year. Um, and until such time that the department conducts a site inspection of the road or highway project. Um, I would like to proffer um, an amendment on line four there to read, um, the deposit fee highlighted herein shall be retained by the department for up to one year. So in other words, the department could go out there next month after the project is completed. And if everybody's satisfied that conditions have been restored to the original condition or better, uh, then give back the deposit to uh, the contractor. But as written right now, the department would not be able to do that. They would have to hold on to that money for one year. Um, and then, um, so they have to hold it for up to one year uh, but probably the other condition there on line five, it says, and until such time that the department conducts a site inspection. So let's say that the department then, for some reason, um, 
is backlogged and does not get out there until, you know, well after 12 months. So then even after the one year lapses, then the department, then the, the you know, then that condition hasn't been met and so really uh, the, the deposit cannot be returned. So I would like to offer the amendment on line four that it would read uh, department for up to one year from the Let's completion. Let's one by one, please. Okay, well, this is a real easy one, actually, if you just. Okay. And so, so it would read department for up to one year from the completion of the road repair or until such time that the department conducts a site inspection. So the two triggers then is uh, change, I was going to change the word on line five and, but then as I, yeah, I, I think we need to change that word and to or. They can hold it for up to one year or until such time that the department conducts a site inspection. Does everybody understand the other amendment? It's, there are two separate ones. One is up to one year and strike and on line five in place or until such time as the department conducts a site inspection and has ascertained that the repairs. No, 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 yes? no. So, so they, they can hold it for up to one year and if an inspection is conducted within the one year, um, then the department can release it. But if, if the department has not come in to do that inspection within the year, then that thing cannot uh, be released. Maybe, I need, maybe we need to uh, look at this. Uh, but well, let's take a short break. Okay. Session, uh, Senator Ada, you still have the floor? Uh, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm gonna, I'm gonna withdraw that amendment. Okay, so without any objections, so ordered. Clerks, you were able to get that? So everything will stay as is. Senator Palacios, um, <clears throat> Closing. To close, yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Be before I move for, uh, for the, uh, making a motion to, I'd like to make uh, an amendment Again, on page four, line 15, after the word highway, uh, strike out the phrase to each original condition prior to the project. And that's because if you read line 14, should the area repaired meet the department's standards set for, for the repair of the road or highway, then the department shall return the, the deposit. So there it is. Uh, as long as the department standard, whatever that was set, uh, that would be sufficient, and that's the, upon the guidance of the legal counsel, and which makes sense. That's the amendment. Strike. On the uh, amendment, which is on page four, line 15 and 16, after the word highway, to delete to its original condition prior to the project, comma. Any objections? No objections, so ordered. 
You still have the floor, Senator. And uh, thank you very much for those input, uh, especially with respect to uh, sit setting a timeline uh, by which, of course, the road project has to be completed or and then allowing for extension. Uh, with that addition, it's just strengthening the bill, and uh, I ask my colleagues to support this. And I move that it be placed in the third reading file for voting, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. On the motion to, to send the bill number 62-31 to the third reading file without any objections, so ordered. We are now on resolution number 74 LS, and I recognize uh, Senator Munya Barnes. Sidzuas Masi, uh, Madam Speaker, and Talawani Sidzuas, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to move resolution number 74-31 COR is introduced by myself and Senator Guthertz uh, to the third uh, reading. And, and can I speak you, on it? Yes, you may continue. Thank you, Sidzuas Masi, Tatlu. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, this bill, um, resolution, I mean, this resolution number 74-31 COR is relative to voicing the Guam legislature's vehement support for the full implementation of public law 110-229 and requesting that the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, the Honorable Janet Napolitano, provide for the issuance of a China-Russia visa waiver program through her parole authority and the issuance of a broader final rule for the Marianas uh, uh, visa waiver program. Madam Speaker, this resolution uh, uh, was introduced on April 12th. And uh, as you know, April 12th of 2011, and it's now almost going to, it's, uh, we're at the end of the August month and we still haven't heard of uh, from from the uh, U.S. Secretary from Homeland Security, but the intent uh, of Resolution 74, Madam Speaker, that it acknowledges that while the federal family has almost had three years to implement uh, this clearly stated congressional intent of Public uh, Law 1110-229, hope has given way to frustration causing some to believe that uh, this delay is the equivalent to, uh, of denial. As, as you know, Madam Speaker, um, unfortunately with the age of the Japanese population and the, uh, combined with the recent natural disasters and economic uncertainty uh, has, uh, has resulted in less outbound travels to Guam uh, from the uh, Japan market. Uh, during uh, its peak period in the 1990s, Guam's share of outbound uh, Japanese market reached uh, approximately 6%. Today, Madam Speaker, our share of the same market has declined to about 4%, 4 uh, representing a nearly negative 33% decline in market strength to grow. Guam uh, must be given the opportunity to expand fully, uh, tapping the economic potential of emerging markets in the China and Russia uh, waiver as, as we were allowed to do with uh, Japan in the late 1980s. And uh, I know that you, Madam Chair, and some of our colleagues were here when that uh, Japan uh, visa waiver program was, was afforded to, to Guam. Madam Speaker, without the full implementation of this public law 110-229 or the issuance of the same parole authority already granted to our neighboring island, uh, Saipan, the singular nature of our tourism economy ties Guam's economic well-being to the fate of one nation. The provisions that created the Marianas Visa Waiver Program were intended to provide for the economic development, not the economic disparity. And yet, Guam uh, must deal with the harm from that disparity today. And while Chinese vis visitors make up only 10% of Saipan's tourism base, these visitors spend 50% more than their Japanese counterparts, 
resulting in an additional 38 million to the CNMI's economy. And at a time when the insular governments are being asked to decrease our dependence on federal dollars, the full implementation of a China-Russia visa waiver program for Guam is both economically imperative and well-timed. The same economic conditions that resulted in the use of the significant economic benefit provision for the CMA, CNMI now also exist on Guam. You know, uh, Madam Speaker, our, our unceasing uh, call for the full implementation of this uh, China-Russia visa waiver program for Guam is also in line uh, uh, with the uh, Travel Promotion Act of 2009, um, um, and that was uh, the United States Administration's call for increased tourism to the United States and a desire to reduce our nation's trade deficit with China. And uh, I'd like to note that though delays surrounding the implementation of congressional intent can be occasion occasionally frustrating and disheartening, we know that executive branch agencies must be extremely diligent and amid, uh, in, amid these tenuous times. Yet, in the course of the last three years, uh, I want you to know, Madam Speaker, that uh, Guam has been visited by several China-based charter flights, uh, bringing a total of uh, 4,200 4, Chinese citizens to Guam uh, without a single overstay or uh, asylum concern. And, and as you and my colleagues know, that, that was one of the major concerns of why uh, the authority wasn't granted to Guam. It is my hope, uh, Madam Speaker, that with the help of this resolution to Congress and the administration fully implementing the mandates of Public Law 110-229, uh, doing so will inspire a new era of prosperity for Guam's people and earn us the thanks for of future generations. And I say that sincerely, Madam Speaker, as you know that Guam, um, Guam's tourism industry is literally responsible for 20,000 jobs, and that's about 60% of our economic base. And you and I also know, um, Madam Speaker, that as we look at where uh, we have most of our eggs marketing with Japan, and, and I know that our, our Japanese tour market has been Guam's number one um, uh, driver in this effort. We know that with the recent downturn, uh, it has really uh, shown a decline in our market here uh, in, to Guam. And as we look at new resources coming in, as we look at enticing um, a, a more economic base of outbound travelers to visit our beautiful tropical paradise. I think it's important that uh, we all unite together and ask the United States to share and give us that same authority and help us move at, uh, forward in their efforts to promote outbound travelers in the United States. As you and I know, Madam Speaker, that we are America in Asia, and we should be afforded those same opportunities. And if it is of, of uh, financial, I mean, uh, security concern, you and I know that, uh, Madam Speaker and my colleagues share that the security of our island uh, uh, has uh, shown that um, Guam is very much um, secured. We have. Uh, Bases from north to south, and uh, based on on the tracking and the reporting of, of of what is happening within our Pacific region, Guam is ready uh, to accept our uh, customs and border patrols. Our customs agent uh, officers are are very very well trained, very well disciplined, and uh, we know that. Um, 
Guam is ready to accept uh, this uh, issuance and uh, we look forward and I'm hoping that my colleagues believe and support this effort as we look at receiving uh, this China-Russia visa waiver program for our island as we look forward to promoting uh, and bringing uh, new resources, much more resources, that our beautiful uh, island needs. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on this resolution 74-31. I know it's been uh, several months, um, but I'm not giving up hope, Madam Speaker, and I'm hoping that my colleagues still believe that with this program uh, uh, being given, to, if they get, when they give it to us, that Guam will see a, see a better and brighter future uh, for our children and for our community. So thank you again for giving me this opportunity to speak and I'd like to ask my colleagues to please help me support this effort and, and, and send this resolution to um, the United uh, States Secretary of Homeland Security, um, Janet uh, Napolitano, and continue to uh, be um, strong um, and uh, firm about wanting this authority for Guam. Sito Smasi. You're welcome, Senator. On the, uh, on the motion, Senator Duenas, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to rise in full support of Resolution 74-31. I would like to thank our good colleague uh, from Pago Bay for proffering such a, an important substantive resolution. Uh, as you may know, Madam Speaker and, and members of the body, my, my very close friends, that I, I worked for 16 years in the tourism industry and, and enjoyed uh, the sometimes good times and sometimes bad times. And I have to say that um, you know, this is an opportunity uh, to bring back some of the good times um, as we move forward and try everything we can uh, in working with the governor's office and working with, with, with every official that we can talk to and whatever type of, uh, of, of, of attention that we can gather uh, for this issue, Madam Speaker, to, to push this issue forward. You know, Madam Speaker, as we just got through discussing some very um, important measures uh, within the, the fiscal budget for this year, you know, of course, there was discussion of, of, of what are the numbers, possible shortfalls, you know, things that we're dealing with going forward. But, um, you know, and I know in the SES meetings and, and, and there's a lot of discussion about economic development. And, and I think that was one component, and, and even yourself, Madam Speaker, had mentioned a number of times that we need to keep talking about. It's not just the shortfalls and not just the, the issues that we face in terms of what this budget looks like. but all opportunities that we can move forward on and work together as a body to see if we can uh, also bring in additional revenue because it's not just about potential cuts and yes right sizing and there's a lot of issues that need to happen but economic development is a huge huge factor and we all know the potential uh, you know that this could bring madam speaker our good friends and brothers and sisters of the CNMI uh, are already embarking upon this market. I've heard a number of times folks say that, you know, it's competitive. I don't believe that, Madam Speaker. I believe that as we move forward in terms of our regional collaboration, in terms of what we all need, the, the wonderful assets that exist within the CNMI, uh, and, and of course, you know, Guam's diverse economy and and, and our also, our face of tourism, I think is a beautiful blend. And I think that uh, we need to continue to work with our brothers and sisters through this resolution, uh, you know, in, in, in the CNMI to, to further these relationships so that we can all benefit um, from, from the tourism and, and the wonderful things that it brings and the wonderful potential uh, to our island. So, Madam Speaker, I, I, I just thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this resolution. And, I once again thank the good author for being very vigilant. Uh, I believe this is the second substantive resolution that she's had with regard to inclusion um, and, and keeping a close and watchful eye on her oversight uh, to ensure that, that nothing slips by, no opportunity slips by. And I certainly look forward to voting on this resolution and, 
giving our, our, our island another opportunity to see what we can do about getting this much needed shot in the arm with regard to this tourism potential uh, to bring in um, you know, guests uh, uh, from China. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker, for this opportunity. You're very welcome, Madam Senator. On the motion, Senator Guthridge, you're recognized. Okay. This is, of course, something that we have to support. Uh, it's nothing new to us because we've been advocating for this for a number of years. And Senator Barnes has been very aggressive in advocating for this, also with Senator Cruz. You know, I remember a few months ago, Governor Calvo, uh, his most recent trip to Washington, met with uh, representatives of the Department of Homeland Security. And he indicated that he had great difficulty even setting up an appointment to meet with a high-level representative from that department. But he was finally able to do it. And he was happy that he was able to do it. And when he came back, he sort of indicated that they were showing more flexibility and more interest in our request. And that's been about, what, a month and a half, half since uh, that visit occurred. But we haven't seen anything or heard anything yet from Washington. And I'm really worried about this, Madam Speaker. And then because of this, I've been looking around and trying to figure out what, what really is going on. And the reality is that we're pushing in this direction hard. But there are others that are pushing against it. And what we're up against is the military establishment, unfortunately. Representatives here from veterans groups are opposed to this when they should be supportive of it. And then we're also facing some extreme rightists in Washington that are opposed to it inside the Department of Homeland Security and elsewhere within the federal government. And of course, we know what their concern is. They're afraid that if we have visitors from the People's Republic of China that some of them may, in fact, be running around taking pictures of our fences and our bases and other assets for strategic military and intelligence purposes. Well, to be very honest with you, that's going on anyway. Not just here, but throughout the Western Pacific, that's going on. You know how easy it is for people to visit other places in the Western Pacific, whether it's our friends, from the Republic of Palau or FSM or even the CNMI or the Marshalls. They have visitors from China all the time. They even have people from China opening businesses in their communities. It's part of the geopolitical strategy to make friends within island communities. I'm not afraid of this. Because I think our intelligence community is strong enough to be able to act when it needs to act. But I think we need more face-to-face -face time with some of these Washington officials. The head of the Department of Homeland Security herself has never visited Guam. Never, never come here. Ms. N Napolitano. And you know, we should invite her to come here. I think that would be a good move from this legislature to invite her to come to Guam, to see our island herself, to feel the island herself, to meet with our tourism industry, to visit the communities on Guam, to meet with our people, to see what it is here. And then she will learn that really the risks are minimal. And I would like to recommend, if I may, to my colleague, the sponsor of this resolution, if somehow we could fit that invitation in the re resolution inviting the uh, 
head of the Department of Homeland Security to please come to Guam and visit the island and meet with our leaders and our tourism industry and our people to get a personal understanding of the uh, requests we have made. And I think that would make a big difference. If I may, I'd like to make that recommendation, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we, we could allow legal counsel to fit that in the resolution, inviting Director of Homeland Security or Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, to come to Guam so, and visit the island and meet with our tourism industry and our leaders and our people and to watch our tourism infrastructure in action here, how we handle our visitors, what they see and what they do here. That's a motion, Mr. Speaker. On the Guthert's amendment to amend the resolution to include a provision um, to have legal counsel include a provision inviting the Secretary of Homeland Security to Guam. Uh, anybody wish to be heard? Speaker Peng Lehman. I would just like to amend that, that we also authorize the governor to send her a round trip ticket to come to Guam. No, I'm serious. Well, I don't object so that to that. So there's no excuse. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. On the Pangolinian Amendment to the Guthard's Amendment, is there any objection? On the Guthard's Amendment, as amended by Senator Pangolinian, any objection? Hearing or seeing none. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Speaker and colleagues. Speaker Wampat and then Senator Frank Boss. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, <clears throat> for the opportunity to, to speak um, on this uh, resolution. As a, as a matter of fact, um, I had received an invitation to go and, and testify, and somehow it didn't happen, but I had submitted a, a written testimony and, um, and the, our congresswoman, of course, had personally had requested that then it actually be a part of the um, of their journal. In in the testimony, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that that I started off basically saying is that the writing is on the wall is very clear that the United States government and the government of Guam must look towards uh, developing other opportunities to maintain the budget levels in the public sector uh, with jobs and also jobs in the private sector. And that um, anything less would result in a continued economic uh, downward spiral. The one thing also that was uh, important in this is to say that the Guam and CNMI visa waiver uh, program is an excellent opportunity to test uh, the market uh, you know, for Russia and China, their, their markets for future considerations in this uh, visa waiver. Uh, you uh, gave testimony also, and you actually provided uh, excellent data uh, about a uh, program here, and this is also uh, consistent with the U.S. Travel Association report that actually says that a, a plan such as this can actually create a 1.3 million U.S. jobs by welcoming international uh, travelers. The question was, was asked of several individuals who were there to testify and a representative of uh, Homeland Security on behalf of Ms. Uh, Napolitano basically said that she would be making her, her decision uh, based on two things. One would be the economy of the individual places, uh, CNMI and and Guam, and the other would be national security. Uh, our congresswoman, of course, pressed on uh, and provided that information that a discussion had taken place, and the governor did this as well, that uh, Admiral Bouchon, in his uh, conversations with them, felt that, or feel that uh, national security was not uh, an issue. Security was not an issue here. Uh, on, on both ends of, uh, of the island. So therefore, uh, hoping that, that the discussion will be narrowed down to the economy. A question was also asked uh, of a 
a, a member from the private sector from CNMI, and she had responded that the question was that do you see this possibly as a, a Guam being a competitor, and would this in any way affect then the number of tourists, uh, Chinese and Russian uh, tourists actually going to CNMI, I mean, not going to CNMI as much because now they want to come to Guam. And her response was that both of the islands, CNMI and Guam, actually offer, uh, have their own unique, uh, uh, I mean, not culture, but uh, what they have to offer the people. And <clears throat> I'd like to, to move on to a, a discussion in which, uh, if you recall, many of our members here, is that I have this uh, policy interns uh, institute that uh, in which interns were <clears throat> are actually uh, in my office and have provided and done research as well. And interestingly is that when they made a presentation to our colleagues and some members of the community and uh, testified here in the legislature, uh, they went on and spoke at K57, they're also on uh, the uh, legislature channel. And some of the questions that were, that were asked that they've done some research that they've actually responded to, to our, our members. And i like to share some of those. I wanted to, to give it to uh, Senator uh, Yamashita, where two of her questions, how do the residents of CNMI feel about Guam's efforts in bringing in China and Russia? And is there a way for Guam and CNMI to both benefit from this waiver, visa waiver program? And interestingly, of course, um, the results are that uh, there was a one one of the uh, Chirac, as a matter of fact, suggested a clever and effective way for tourists to visit both Guam and CNMI, essentially benefiting both areas. And unlike the CNMI, Guam is devoid of casinos and the absence of gambling activities, such as those that occur in, a, in casinos, places Guam in a unique position to market our island as a wholesome family destination to Chinese and Russian tourists. Uh, who would come to, to visit. So that was just one way in which to, to highlight some of the things that's offered there that we don't offer here. And then the other is a combined uh, package of you know coming to CNMI and coming and extending also uh, uh, to Guam. Uh, and, the, and the other is uh, in terms of how the residents feel about this, and this is really very interesting, although I know it actually came from uh, the paper where they're saying that an unnamed resident uh, said that uh, Guam already has the military to lean on, and here in Saipan they you know, would really need something uh, like this to continue, of course, in uh, their island and, uh, and feel that you know, cinema is economically disadvantaged already. So, you know, one, one person, of course, is uh, sensing that. The, the other is um, the concern that uh, the representative for Homeland Security was concerned about is the um, Russian or Chinese actually overstaying uh, their visa. And several suggestions, and this is very interesting, is that some of the possibilities that could actually happen is requiring that these tourists then to Guam and CNMI post a monetary bond as a condition for travel. And are interesting. The other is a liability insurance for tour operators, travel ent and entities, and hotelers. That uh, you know, you can you can find these companies then if you know an, an individual or more under their jurisdiction overstays uh, their visit, and that uh, you know if such companies will then make it a priority to make sure that they do not stay beyond their time. And, and uh, they also provided that real-time traveler database, which, you know, of course, uh, uh, through the immigration uh, office that they're able to, they, they do have their database, but also having the hotels update uh, their status for all the, uh, their tourists. And lastly, is a systems of fines and fees by instituting this, you know, that uh, uh, to make sure that, you know, they're not, uh, that these illegal immigrants would not be permitted to, to find work and to, to continue to live here. And, and these are by uh, several of our students, uh, an intern by Bing Wang, and the other one is Steve Shin, uh, who responded to our colleagues here, and I'm hoping that 
one of our other members here would also be able to provide testimony again as well in which uh, another intern has provided uh, information. Uh, so what, what I, in, in closing really is that in, in the wake of this extreme financial uncertainty, um, I think that this is something in which I think both of us in the United Voice need to pursue and this uh, resolution you know, does just that uh, to make sure then that basically we're saying that we are providing an alternative, a solution to be able to help ourselves and not have to go and continuously ask for, for federal you know, handouts. And as you know, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that you have indicated that and taken a very strong position about where we are uh, economically, nationally, and internationally. And we depend, yes, uh, on uh, what 40 percent of our revenues from the federal government. And should uh, the committee, this uh, powerful committee in 12, should not reach a consensus, then automatically we stand to be cut. Our federal programs stand to be cut by 20 percent. And that includes not just the programs itself that we provide, services that we provide, but it would actually include individuals who are federally fund, whose positions are federally funded. Uh, through this visa waiver, uh, we would be helping ourselves uh, to be able then to, to provide the resources that our government uh, would be able to, to realize from these tourists who are not here for three days, but could actually, the average in um, cinema has been anywhere been six to 15 days. And uh, many times Mr. Tourism say, would say, if we can just ask or have them extend one more day, imagine how much money we'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to realize. But here we have tourists who would be, who do stay from six to 15 days. And, and I, I just hope that, I'm, I'm thinking that everyone really agrees in here and that this resolution will be passed unanimously. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Bloss, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, Mr. Speaker, um, like the previous speaker before me, um, the good lady from, from Malolo, um, and if you uh, indulge me, please. I think it was very important that uh, as she had spoken, there was uh, um, interns that uh, you know that uh, worked in, in her office over over the summer, and one of the projects that, that as she has stated, was was to look into and provide research and a presentation to members of this body and to the community on <coughs> the whole issue of China visa, China Russia visa waiver. Um, I had the opportunity of being able to attend this briefing, and in the briefing, um, I did pose a question to to the panel. I think that it's um, if. You, provide to me the uh, privilege of being able to read a prepared uh, response by, by one of the interns um, who was, I guess, tasked by, by uh, their, their leader to be able to, to take the question and, and do the proper research and get back to, to the senator providing the, the question. And so, if you, if you please provide, Madam Speaker, I'd like to read the response for the record um, provided by, by this member. And it says, Dear Senator Blas Hafaday, you recently attended a briefing relative to the inclusion of China and Russia in the Guam CNMI visa waiver program. Provided herewith is a response to your question, why are we looking at China and Russia? Based on my research, there are several sound reasons there, there are several sound reasons appear why the governments of Guam and the CNMI are focusing on China and Russia to be added to the CN, Guam CNMI visa waiver program. Proximity. By plane, China is five hours away and Russia is eight hours away. This makes Guam a sh far shorter flight when compared to a flight to California, which would take 11 hours. Climate. With an average water temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, beautiful beaches, and pristine waters, Guam would be highly attractive to a highly attractive destination for people who li live near the frigid waters of Vladivostok, 
whose average temperature, water temperature, is a cool 40.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Proven market. Thirdly, it is a proven market. By extending a visa waiver to other countries would be risky. We would be, be unsure if people would be willing to come to Guam or even if they heard of Guam. The Chinese and Russians, however, have long visited the CNMI and would most likely be willing to come to Guam to further enhance their experience in the Micronesian Islands. In a 2008 hearing before the House Subcommittee on Insular Affairs, Oceans, and Wildlife, Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz stated that Chinese and Russian tourists could potentially generate $212.2 million in combined payroll, hotel lodging, and gross receipt taxes by 2018. Precedent and political momentum. Fourthly, and most importantly, the visa waiver has been extended to the CNMI, and so we see that a precedent has been already been set. It would only be proper if we on the island of Guam are extended the same privileges that are extended to our brothers and sisters on Saipan. On behalf of the interns of the Public Policy Institute at Speaker Juan Pat's office, I would like to thank you for recognizing us in the special session held on Tuesday, the 2nd of August, 2011. My name is Joseph Buddy, and, I'm an intern and, and I am an intern from the Public Policy Institute for Speaker Juan Pat. Sinceramente, Joseph Buddy. And I think, Madam Speaker, again, that was very important because this is a process, and this was not only from the, what was, what was enlightening was the institute was made up of, of high school students, and in some cases, college-bound students, college students, who took the time to be able to research. And I think there was a, it was very, um, the, the research that they did was very intense. And expose themselves to the questions not only from this body from but also from the from the members of the public not only in the public hearing setting but also on radio so it was tested and I, I in in their honor and as for for the work that they've done I, I felt that it was proper and appropriate that we that, that I read the letter for the record that said madam speaker is I am in support of the resolution and I feel that as we continue, and as we want to continue to expand and grow in our economy and, and, the, and, the, and diversify uh, those areas of our economy, I, one of those areas that we, get, we look into is expanding the, the, the type of tours or the tourists that come in here from the different nations. With regards to the safety and security concerns about, about China and Russia, it's proven, and as far as the parole authority already granted to the CNMI, you know, the, over, over the last past few years, there has been no reported uh, incidents that would cause them to rethink this whole process. You know, very recently um, in articles not only on CNN but Fox News but other uh, nationalized news services, there was a whole report with regards to the Chinese military and its, and, it, and its upgrade. But I think at the same process, they also talk about how Chinese, the, the, the Chinese government as well as the Russian government were in, they, they were in economic partnership, if you will. For God's sake, China owns part of our debt. You don't, you know, as, as an enemy, you, you're not going to go after somebody who owns your debt. You're going to hope that that individual whom you own the debt to is prosperous so that you get a return on your investment. So that, that works towards us as well. So I, I think that it's very appropriate with regards to our continuous push so that we, we can hopefully encourage the Department of Homeland Security in rethinking or in speeding up their thought process in providing us the, the, the ability to be able to have a visa waiver program for Chinese and Russian visitors. That said, Madam Speaker, I, there is one amendment I'd like to make to, to, the, to the resolution. And actually, it's going to be found on page two, um, on line 26. Actually, the whereas on, on, uh, that, that incorporates line 26 is whereas Guam's inclusion in a China-Russia visa waiver program will provide Guam with the economic stability required for growth and progress. I'd like to add on line 26, after the word will, add the words help to. So it will say, the program will help to provide. Um, basically, when, when you read that without the words help to, it, it, make, it almost sounds like we were putting all of our eggs in one basket. And that as a, if we don't get this, we're not going to have the 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 requirement for or the economic stability required for growth so but this will help to along with the other things that we continue to do and we're trying to do to build in our to build in our ability um, to grow and to, and to progress so it's to work to include the words 
help too after will on line 26. On the amendment, no objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And with that, I encourage and please ask my, my colleagues also to, uh, to support the, the resolution. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, are there any other speakers? Mr. Vice Speaker, do you have anything? You've taken the lead here, so. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I have been pushing this for several years, so, and I think everybody has covered all the points. Um, I'm glad that uh, the retiring speaker did mention that the young man that did the research noted that in my testimony before the Congress that uh, I gave some statistics about how much money this was going to bring to Guam. We currently, with our visitors from Japan, get about $600 in their purchasing power here when they, when they get here, since most of them buy their, their, uh, mm -hmm. their uh, packets in, in, in Japan. But the um, Chinese and the Russian visitors uh, will be bringing in and spending on Guam in excess of $4,000 apiece during their visits. Um, that's going to be a great shot in the arm for our business privilege tax and for the additional um, inclusion of, um, I mean, expansion of the tourism industry. So the stats are all there. I still don't understand who it is in Washington that's holding it up. But that doesn't mean that I'm not in support of this. I really want to push this through. Um, and um, there's only one amendment that I'd like to ask, and, and maybe this can be worked out between the sponsor and the, and the um, legal counsel. And I, I just have problems with the word vehement in the title. And if we can just amend that, I'd be very happy. Thank you. And I, what, I fully support it. What page is that on? In the title, oh, in the line title. two. The word uh, vehement, ve to change it to something other than vehement. So legal counsel then will, uh, no objections, so order. So uh, Senator Munir Barnes uh, to close. Oh, you want to speak? Okay, Speaker Ben then uh, on the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Skip, Speaker, I certainly rise in full support of this effort as well as all the other efforts that have occurred in the past and continue to occur today to try and get some movement on this issue uh, in Washington. All of us have put our own efforts into finding any avenue available to us to push this issue and place it before the authorities that are empowered to make the decision that would allow us to implement a program that will bring Russian and Chinese tourists to Guam under a less cumbersome and less um, arduous process. And we want to do that in order to ensure that we continue to develop our markets and diversify our markets. It's no secret that this is one of the initiatives that the governor also supports and is actually banking on uh, to support uh, any additional government operations and growth. And that really without this, it is hard for us to support any other increases in the cost of our government uh, and in any additional borrowing. I mean, this to bank on this that we can continues to elude us to obligate ourselves to debt service payments over the next 30 years, I think is, you know, at this time not prudent, but it doesn't stop this body from collectively working together with, in our membership as well as with the governor to try and push this initiative. Because the success of this initiative just means that we're able to provide additional resources and economic growth that will benefit the members of our community. And so in that respect, I certainly stand wholeheartedly in support of this effort. I do want to make one statement for the record and try to work on some technical changes that may need to be made to the bill to just be very sure. We do know that the 
reference has always been a China-Russia visa waiver program, but the statutes, I don't believe, have that reference in the statute. They refer to the Marianas quoted in the first page of the bill, Public Law 110-29, the reference in statute is the Marianas Visa Waiver Program, which would allow a entry of a Japanese and, I mean, a Russian and a Chinese tourist into Guam and the Marianas without the requirement for a visa. And so I understand the expediency from our, from our local perspective of referring to it as a Ch China-Russia visa waiver program, I just want to be assured that when we pass it with that expediency that it is identifiable and statutorily correct so that the powers in Washington can refer to the appropriate requirements and law that would allow them to fully understand uh, and not have any other misgivings uh, about what are we talking about. And so in that respect, I'd like to just request and make a general motion that when we refer to the China-Russia visa waiver program, that we include additional language that is technically correct so that it is identifiable uh, and, and, uh, and easily ascertained in Washington of exactly what we're talking about, where they have the power in statutes to provide relief to, the, to our community. So just a general motion on that. It's a very good suggestion, Mr. Speaker. I, I think it has something to do with parole authority. That's correct. And so if there's no objection, we'll uh, ha authorize legal counsel to make the correction to uh, also known as, or some kind of right. legally known yes. as, um, yes. the, the pro parole. something or other parole authority. OK. Thank you very much. And, and, um, Thank you for the, my colleagues for indulging uh, my um, suggestion and, and motion. It is really, um, I think, the one of the best things about this is, in terms of understanding its impact to the community of Guam, is that statute is the um, statistics that you pointed out, Mr. Vice Speaker, <coughs> of what this means. In addition. <clears throat> to ensuring that we have additional tourists, this is what you call low impact, high return tourism. And I think that one of the stresses that we are putting into our tourism infrastructure is our dependency on high volume, high impact tourism that costs us more to service this high volume not because of high volume, but just the demand that this numbers put on our tourism infrastructure. You know, when you visit other tourism sites across the globe, most especially when those that are catering to cultural tourism and, and the history and the culture of the place, of which everybody seems to think is the diversification needed for our tourism base, when you do this kind of tourism, when you have high volume, you have high impact, high cost, high maintenance. And you actually begin to deteriorate your tourism infrastructure because of this. This type of tourist is, will have a low impact on our tourism infrastructure in terms of denigrating it and, and using it, but will have a high volume return to our economy given the nature of the tourists, the type of spending they occur, their length of stay in our community, and their interactions with our community. And so we've seen this occur in other jurisdictions. We've seen it with our closest example with our northern neighbors who have had for, the, for many years benefited uh, as a diversified group of tourists that they attract this low impact, high return tourists of the Chinese and the Russians. And as you mentioned, you know, it takes four, four to five Japanese tourists, maybe eight Japanese tourists, to have the same economic impact that a single Russian tourist or a single Chinese tourist may have on Guam. And that's just because of where we've evolved with regards to our attraction as a destination from our Japanese tourists. We've moved 
from, and some of this has, be, has been beyond our control. Some of this has been the control of foreign trade agreements between the U.S. and Japan, the status of duty-free and taxation, the bilateral tax treaties, how the Japan has changed its internal taxing structure on luxury goods and so forth that have deteriorated our base of Japanese tourists from the high shop, high, car, high expenditure tourists because of the change that has occurred in the Japanese economy as well as the Japanese government taxing uh, policies that no longer tax high-end luxury goods as much as they used to for those that you can buy domestically in Japan. And so these kind of changes that have occurred over the market in the years have not reflected the changes we've done in our own local marketing and local development of our tour tourism infrastructure towards Japanese that has now resulted in us being a low budget, low, I don't want to say the word, low budget destination for, for, for the Japanese tourists. And so this gives us an opportunity to diversify that base, upgrade our infrastructure to service the more demanding tourists, and maximize the infrastructure that we have in place without having to sink more money into it of preserving our tourism infrastructure, most especially when we take a look at the development of this historic and cultural attractions that we have for these tourists who can now come through and not have placed that stress that, that high volume will place on our tourism infrastructures in, uh, in our community. So I certainly, for all of these reasons and all the other reasons articulated by members of this body and members of our community that have continued their efforts to try and put this program in place, uh, believe that this will help and foster uh, and focus more attention on in Washington that is currently being given and currently being able to be directed by those in Washington that are there representing us today. And so we need to help them uh, focus the attention. We need to give them the ammunition. We need to give them the direction because sometimes the direction that they're interested in is not things that will make things better for us here and that they have other concerns uh, and that you know they think this is local politics and we should all be the only ones here and they're off to Iraq or Afghanistan while we continue to try and put policies in place and focus the direction of Washington policies on those that are gonna make a difference in our lives here. And so I think this is a good move and, and, and certainly support it and thank my colleagues also for their support. Thank you, Senator Ben. Any other senator wish to be heard on the uh, resolution? Do you wish to close or send it down? Mr. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you in your efforts too as, uh, as my vice chair, but also as oversight chair in the past of, of your efforts and continuing to move this off, over and as we work together as an island community to get this going for Guam. Um, I think it's important that 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 uh, this program um, be authorized for for Guam, and that in this efforts that Guam uh, will look into uh, economic prosperity. Um, um, Mr. Speaker, if I may, uh, uh, I know that. Um, I forgot to put some of the sponsors who said they supported the efforts of this uh, resolution. And if I could at this time, I'd like to put uh, Speaker Wampat, yourself, uh, Mr. Speaker, but also uh, uh, my brother, Frank Bloss, and Speaker uh, Ben Panglinen as, as sponsors in that order. And if, and if anyone else would like to jo uh, join They'd, we'd have it in, in alphabetical order after that, if, if that. Any objection? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity, and I'll move it to the, I mean, for the voting. 
Any objection to moving to the voting file? Hearing none, the resolution is moved to the voting file. The next bill to is um, Senator Barnes, no, Senator Mabini on Bill 94. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Bill 94 is an act to, an act to, uh, to require the Department of Education to administer a career interest inventory pilot program to middle and high school students. And this was, a uh, public hearing was actually heard in March 17. We've, since then, we've received um, quite a number of feedback from our community, including Department of Education, Guam Community College, and some um, and counselors who, who would be directly affected by this type of legislation. Excuse me. I'd like to. <laughs> I'd like to make, sorry, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to make a motion to move it to the third reading file. the third reading, and you're going to speak on it? Okay, so you may proceed. Thank you. Um, okay, so going back, again, this, this bill was actually introduced because of uh, concerns that I have, as well as my colleagues. Um, thank you again to my co-sponsors. Uh, to... Uh, uh, Senator Wanpat, Senator Yamashita, for supporting this, uh, this bill. Now, the intent of this bill was originally was to basically address the concerns that we have regarding our students who need to transition, who are um, challenged with the transition to uh, life after high school. And we also want to try to build better collaboration between the schools, the colleges, and the, our labor force so that there is a, that success, successful transition. Without that transition or success, students tend to either drop out or they end up having, um, having to meet the world outside of high school with no real clear direction. And so this bill helps begin addressing this now let me let me share that some of the testimonies that we received, like from Department of Education, there's some of the concerns have already been addressed by the substituted bill, um, which I believe I'm supposed to move to accept the bill as substituted. Already? Okay, it, thank it's, you. It's accepted. Yeah. Um, it's already addressed in this bill regarding the planning, the curricular issues, funding issues, and so forth. Now, one of the things that um, that I will, I, will, I will mention later on is regarding an amendment regarding um, the terminology career interest inventory. So it's a little bit of a technical change, but um, I'll refer to that in a moment. I think what, my, what I would like our colleagues, my colleagues to recognize again is that our school system at the moment does not have a really clear um, system where students can transition, can easily uh, begin seeing where their careers or what, what possible careers are out there for them. We know we've, we have existing programs in place like academies. Um, we, and, and for those of us who are not as quite familiar what academies are, what I'm talking about are, are particular uh, programs that are specific to certain careers like nursing or um, uh, nursing or marketing or whatnot. What this address goes back, what this address addresses uh, are students going further back, in this case, middle students. I think that some of the challenges that our counselors are finding is that by the time students reach high school, there's still that sense of confusion as to what and where they're supposed to go. To go. This particular bill will require um, students starting from middle school to begin identifying what are their career options and then when they go into high school they, they should be able to continue their path and as the bill stipulates I believe it's on page four um, basically middle school students upon enrollment in their seventh and, or eighth grade will as well as public high schools upon their entry into ninth and tenth grade will begin having some exp the, the exposure needed to start identifying the kind of career options. Now let me go back, if you don't mind, uh, to an amendment that I'd like to actually uh, propose on this bill. And this is because of strong, resp uh, strong response that I got from the career counselors. 
the, the title of the bill talks about career interest inventories. And as they had explained, it's almost like talking about the tool within a toolbox. And what we should be talking about is a toolbox. And, and they're right. So um, I propose to make an amendment to, instead of honing in on the tool called the career interest inventory, what they ha are suggesting is that we, as a, as a, a body, consider, this, uh, consider the a career information delivery system, or what they call, what the industry calls SIDS. And within that SIDS would be like career interest inventories and a system. What they're concerned about is that if we just tell them that this is a tool that the schools, middle school and high schools are supposed to use, it doesn't address the system that's actually what's needed in place. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, submit um, an amendment uh, that uh, on the document um, to change career interest inventory to career informa information delivery system. So yeah. you're, you want to replace career interest inventory? Yes, with career with information delivery system. And that would encompass career interest inventories and we don't necessarily um, uh, focus in on one particular product, we're talking about an actual system. And, and the, the general then amendments so is not just on the title. That's every right. Every place where it talks about career interest inventory to replace it with career information delivery system. That's correct. And, and, and in my assessment, it looks like the title page, page three, four, five, and six. And also, Madam one, Speaker. One, yeah, one, one moment. Um, sure. Cause, so it's everywhere, because like for example, you're saying in page three, line 26? Page three, we have it on line, uh, that's right, line 26. On page four, we have it on line 20, uh, excuse me, line seven? Line six and seven. seven. Yes. Six and seven. We also have it on line 24 and 26. On the same page, 24. That's correct, the same page. On page five, line one. Okay, uh, I, I guess my concern here is I want to make sure that when you, when you read with this change that you're able to read, when you read it, that it does flow and yes. it does describe. Are you going to um, put a, a, a definition or anything like that or, or uh, just? No, but I can certainly insert that in as a definition. Um, right now, the, uh, just as much as we didn't have a, okay. a, a definition of a career interest inventory, the career interest the, uh, delivery system is basically just a terminology to that encompasses um, a system to help the kids um, figure out what their careers are. Okay, so, so yeah. All right, so on, on the uh, amendment, uh, which is uh, starting with the title and throughout uh, the bill that to replace career interest inventory with career information delivery system. On the amendment, are there any objections? No objections, so order. Okay, okay. Senator, uh, you still have the floor. Yes, and uh, just one minor change as well on page, um, just to, to make sure that the, the flow of the, of the text is uh, clear on page three, line 21. Just for clarification, so line 20 and to 21 should read, uh, starting at the end of line 20, career interest inventories is a, in an insert, to be inserted, career interest inventories is a tool in a career interest, excuse me, career information delivery system to empower students, etc. So on page three, starting on line uh, 20, it should read career interest inventory. Yes, career interest inventories. Okay, oh, IES. Yes. Is um, a tool, tool in a career information, information delivery, system delivery system to, and it continues on, to empower 
students to be more self-driven? Yes. On that uh, amendment, are there any objections? No objections? Yeah, please make sure we get that in writing so that the yes, uh, clerks it. will be able okay. to uh, follow mm -hmm. through. Um, so on that amendment, when, which is on page three, then line 21, without any objections, so ordered. Uh, what about 24? Yes. No, that, I'm, that stays just as it is then. Yes. And uh, page four, title five, page, I'm sorry, line five, that ch changes to that again, the same as the front. I'm sorry, what line, what page? Page four, line five. Yes, that's correct, thank you. That should read career information delivery system. You may continue. Anything else? Yes. And finally, um, you know, the goal, uh, uh, Madam Speaker and colleagues, is that at the end of the day, uh, we should be seeing graduates who are all declared majors because they know where they're going, and that call. And, and in this case, colleges and and our industry will be able to receive them and begin also making plans, as opposed to having graduates still floundering and not sure where they're. Uh, where they should be going. So again, our goal is uh, through this type of measure, through a pilot program, that we should be able to begin helping our students um, find a successful uh, transition after high school. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I welcome Senator on the motion then to send uh, bill number 94-31 as substituted. Uh, Senator Pangolin, you recognize. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I just rise with the changes that were just made. Now I'm kind of confused because apparently when the bill was written, what was in the bill was the tool, I guess according to the explanation. So what is described in the bill is the tool. Now that we're making the change, we're now saying the toolbox. So, but we didn't change anything at all except we're now calling the tool the toolbox so are we now saying that the entire system is just this or is there other things in the system that is more than the tool you know what I mean so it's, I, and it only just struck me in terms of just the the, the example being used so it's kind of like that if I'm a gonta you know when we the program or the system. Wraparound is the program. If I'm a gonta, I mean, if I'm a gonta is the program, wraparound is the system. But wraparound is not if I'm a gonta. But here, we're now saying that the tool and the toolbox are the same thing, and there's nothing else in the toolbox because the tool is the toolbox. I, I don't know, I'm just kind of confused. I just want to make sure that we're not closing the door to other things that are part of this career information development system or whatever that is, that there's not other things that can fit under this. Um, you know, and, and it's not just now just confined to this, that the system is more than what is in here, but what is in here in the bill is what we're calling this, the system. And it's, is it the entire system now? Or are there other things that can be part of the system? I'm just trying to get that absolutely clear in my mind. You know, that we're not just creating something by just calling it something. That there are other factors that need to be part of this career system. Uh, and it's not just the, the career um, list or survey or, or process of identifying those paths. So that, that's my only concern on, on this on what has just transpired, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker Ben. On the motion, are there any other speakers to close? Uh, Senator Mabini. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to uh, my colleague from um, Barragada. 
Is that right? Um, just in reference to the to the to the question that was just raised, that the yes, this be, this becomes the tool in itself, because in in and by itself, if if we, if we if I had left this and this was the concern that the counselors made, if if we had left it as that, it would have been just a standalone tool that doesn't invite collaborative effort in making this career, you know, uh, to, to make this career uh, identification, or excuse me, career, career interest uh, information delivery system. So this, by, by changing, the, by, by having this as the toolbox, it actually um, brings in more, uh, more um, buy-in with all the people, or should be have more buy-in with all people who would be involved in making sure that we have a system in place to help these kids develop and Id identify their careers. And um, I look forward to Bill 94 coming eventually into law so that we can continue assisting our students to be successful after high school. Thank you, Madam Chair. On Madam the Speaker. motion then to, to send Bill 94-31 to third reading file without any objections. Ordered. Substitute bill number 107 COR recognized as uh, Senator Munya Barnes. Situs Masi, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'd like to move bill number. Uh, 107-31 COR is substituted by the Committee on Health and Human Services, Economic Development, Senior Citizens, and Election Reform to the third reading. And if I can speak to it, please, speak on it, yes, please. Yes, you may. Please proceed. Please proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, um, Bill Number 107 as substituted. Uh, this is an act that will add new sections 12212.1, 12212.2, and sections 12212.3, the chapter 12 of Title 10 Guam Code annotated. And Madam uh, Speaker, this is relative to the public disclosure of a physician's professional profile, which may be cited as the Patient Protection Through Information Act. The uh, Patient Protection Through Information Act, Madam Speaker, will require that the Guam Board of Medical Examiners to publicly disclose to individual citizens and via the internet what is commonly referred to as a physician's professional profile. And this uh, pr uh, physician, profi physician profile laws have been authorized in California, Washington State, New York, Rhode Island, and Oregon. And Bill 107 is modeled after the state of California statute and has been tested by courts. We also worked with both the Guam Medical Association and the Guam Medical Society to address um, their concerns and garner their support. The measure is substituted, Madam Speaker, will require the public disclosure of the uh, temporary restraining orders issued interim um, suspensions, orders issued, revocations, suspensions, probations, or limitations on practice ordered by the board, including those made part of a probationary order or stipulated agreement. This would also uh, include the public letters or rec reprimands issued and infractions, uh, citations, or fines imposed, civil judgments in any amount for damages for death or personal injury caused by the physician and surgeon's negligence, error, or omission in practice, or by his or her rendering of unauthorized professional services in all settlements within the last three years if there are two or more. And this would also include any uh, summaries of hospital disciplinary actions that result in the termination or revocation of a licensee's staff privileges for medical disciplinary cause or reason unless a court finds in a final judgment that peer review resulting in the disciplinary action was uh, conducted in bad faith. Madam Speaker, um, this bill 
uh, really says that no patient should avoid necessary medical care because they are too afraid to receive it. Our, um, this measure operates on the premise that truly knowing your physician's places, uh, truly knowing your physician, your doctor, places patients in charge of patient care. And um, I just want to say that uh, as we look at uh, our medical community today, and we look at wanting to make sure that our physicians in our community provide the best medical care for their patients. Um, like I said earlier, no patient should be afraid to get, uh, to get care. They should know what their doctor has gone through. And uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I know that this version was the substituted version, and if I'm not mistaken, it was the, the actual um, implementation to, instead of three uh, for disciplinary actions, it was moved down to two. So in, I asked my colleagues that they help me support this patient protection through information acts because I truly believe that it empowers the patients to be in control of how they want their care and know where their doctor's profile is and know that they should feel safe when they're going to receive medical care from their physician. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to briefly speak on this. I know it's almost five o'clock and we have a couple of other public hearings, but I really hope that my colleagues help me support uh, th this effort and, and support this bill 107-31. Thank you, Sidos Masi. Can we take a brief recess? Um, Madam Speaker, if I may, um, I, I know it's 5 o'clock and we do have a public hearing real soon, so I'm going to ask that, uh, um, I know I've done opening uh, testimony on this, but if we can just move to recess until uh, tomorrow morning at 9. 9. Thank you very much, Senator. We will uh, be in recess until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs>